At Chris Kaler Holistic, we demonstrate real healing and real caring to your health issues and needs. Our solution for you is an alternative to the alternative. Our out-of-the-box treatment methods are aimed to your specific well-being and are quite different than most. Venturing down the realm of quantum energy healing, Chris uses unique modalities of healing, such as spiritual intervention with pendulum dowsing, sacred geometry tools such as the neutralization, divinity, and sun ring. Another tool Chris uses is a five-tiered pyramid affectionately known as the Silver Light Pyramid to activate quantum activity within the body. Also, Chris Kaler Holistic uses radionic technologies in various platforms with specific liquid mineral ionics to balance out excesses and deficiencies within the body. At Chris Kaler Holistic, our goal is to get tangible and measurable results in the least amount of time possible so you can carry on with what's important in your life. Another advantage to this unique energy healing is that it can be done at a distance healing session so location is not a barrier and can be done conveniently at your home, office, just about anywhere through Skype or telephone conferencing. Eliminate costly protocols, expensive monthly supplements, high-priced allopathic operations, invasive surgeries, and dubious medication applications that keep you trapped in a financial and health rat race. Get a specific, customized, out-of-the-box solution tailored for your health recovery. At Chris Kaler Holistic, we are warm welcoming and want to put you at ease with your visit to us. Please visit www.chriskaler.net for further information as we welcome your questions and inquiries to starting this unique journey. At Chris Kaler Holistic, we want to show you that we are the alternative to the alternative and the out-of-the-box solution to customize an answer for you to spend less and gain more in your high-vibrancy journey. Visit www.chriskaler.net. Real healing and real caring to your health needs. Introduce to you to the world, Chris Kaler. That if he wants to book an appointment, he can do it online like everybody else. Hey, everybody! <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the rip roaring edition <laughs> of a quantum view. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy—he he wants in so badly, but you know what? Nobody cuts in line. <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> you want to book an appointment with Chris Kaler? You better do it online like everybody else. I got a waiting list <laughs> as long as my arm, and <laughs> everybody wants in. You just made my day, you know that? <laughs> hey, how are you, Bob? I am absolutely fine. If I can laugh, I'm good. Today is a full moon. Yeah, right? and everything. So, that's what I wrote to you about. Everything is upside down. Everything including people down yeah wonky wonky wow we've been having some wonderful wonderful results in the office today yesterday it's been a wonderful shift right through the lion's gate it's been doing us a lot of favor let's put it that way so lots of new information coming in lots of good stuff lots of negative son of a gun energies are leaving which is just a wonderful thing it's all what we all want to hear now one of the, the big things in energy that we're working with lately a big one is abduction. A lot of people, their energies are getting abducted, and we've been doing our best to bring those back, and it's working. It, it, is, it really is working, and it's making a big deal. An another big one, there's a constellation that I found. What's the bear constellation? I can't remember that one, but it's the leg of the bear which is a connection with a lot of dark energy. If we disconnect a person from there, it seems to loosen things up and open the door a lot more, and it's, it's making a big difference that way. Uh, removing people from slavery. That's been huge. Everybody is enslaving to, number one, reptilians, number two, enslaving to time. Everybody's got some kind of slavery going on. What's your slavery, Bob? What do you mean? What are you enslaving to? Um, I really, I, you know, really, seriously, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of loose in that department. You, you're kind of loosey goosey. Well, yeah, you know, I'm kind of loose in that that's department. The way, that's the way that humanity needs to be is, is on their own, 
have your own free will, be able to think for yourself without all these thoughts coming in. People's mind, you could sit there and have a hundred thousand thoughts go through your mind and not know exactly where they're coming from. And that's what we're all trying to do here is just try to make you sovereign, make you your own person, make you your own personality and soul and all, all that type of stuff. Now, we got a special guest tonight. Now, this guy, let me tell you, when I started doing internet radio, I had no idea that I was going to be bringing on guests like this. I mean, the, every time L.A. Marzulli comes on, it's an incredible show. The guy's just got so much information, so much documentation. He does so much work to find out what the heck is going on with all of these ancient civilizations and ancient races, actual science to it. So we're going to be talking about Watchers 10. L.A. Marzulli is an author, lecturer, and filmmaker. Now, his films, if you have seen any of his DVDs, the production value is Hollywood quality. This guy puts <laughs> thought and he puts talent into these things. He teamed up with film producer Richard Shaw to create the Watchers series. There are now 10 installments in the series. He won the UFO Best Film, the People's Choice Awards at the UFO Congress back in 2014. Marzulli is a frank supernaturalist who has lectured on the subjects of UFOs, the Nephilim, ancient prophetic texts, presenting his ex exhaustive research at conferences and churches, as well as appearances and interviews on numerous national and international radio television programs. Let's welcome to the program L.A. Marzulli. Hey, Chris. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Hi, well, L.A. This, this is number three, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Mm. yeah. Tonight, we're talking about Watchers 10. Now, I had the privilege, thank you very much, my friend, for sending me a, a link to Watchers 10. And th there is some information within there that might make people's heads spin a little bit. Tell us a little bit about what got you into to the whole concept of, of, of the Watchers series and exposing and finding out all this information that you're bringing to humanity. Well, with all due respect to the guys over at Ancient Aliens, and I mean, they have a really successful show, and I think it's like eight years in running. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're obviously hitting it out of the park. But I was on the first two seasons of Ancient Aliens, season one, season two. And look, you know, um, Prometheus has a worldview. They have a paradigm in which they operate under. And that's fine. More power to them. I mean, they're the guys that are foot in the bill doing the production. So they can spin things however they want to spin them. But I took umbrage because I just felt like I was being so heavily edited. They want me, they wanted me back for season three. And I just declined because I couldn't, I felt like I just couldn't get a fair shake in the editing room. So, I mean, it's one thing if you say something like, well, you know, Noah was, was, was around and, uh, uh, before the flood, he was building an ark and, uh, Noah was saved in the ark along with the other animals. And then all of a sudden you watch, watch it on the history channel. And it's like, I'm saying something, you know, Noah was an extraterrestrial. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> How did that work? So. Uh, and we got a lot of blowback from people from from our fans going, you know, oh, hey, my gosh, I can't believe what they did. So after the second season, I mean, that was sort of it for us. We just kind of went, well. And so um, I was down at a, a casting call. And what I mean by that is um, a friend of mine said, hey, they're trying to put this show together. It's right up your alley. Why don't you call them? And, and actually, these people contacted me. In fact, that's what happened. They contacted the production team, contacted me. They had seen heard me on Coast to Coast and stuff, and they were – putting together a, a, a show um, called The Gray Area. That's what it was called. And so I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm interested. I'll, I'll go down and check it out. And this is long before Watchers. This is, you know, I'm just writing books at this point. So I get there for the casting call, and there are three female models. There are two street magicians. There's the guys from UFO Hunters that are there. Um, there's a couple of other people. No one's written anything. No one's actually in the field except maybe for the UFO hunter guys because they were they were genuine. I mean, you know, they were out in the field doing stuff. So I get it. But no one's written anything. I'm the only guy with actually actually written a book and, you know, actually done some research. And I did the casting call and I realized, oh, my gosh, this is how Hollywood. In other words, what it enabled me to do was go in behind the scenes and see how they construct these shows. And they basically have a casting call. 
and they bring people in and they look for chemistry between the people. And that's the show. And then everything is pretty much scripted. And, you know, yeah, you're going to say a little bit of what you want, but they're going to they're going to give you guidelines and they're going to um, have you kind of weigh in as what you would say. But it's it's scripted. It's definitely scripted. You're not reading off a cue card, but it's scripted. They're going to direct the show in the way that they want to go. So I left the casting call, literally screaming and yelling on my iPhone as I was driving home. And I called my good friend Richard Shaw, and I'm screaming and yelling. I'm like, you can't believe this. Ah! You know, the whole thing. I'm never going to work this. And it's just like, I really, I said, Rick, we've got to make our own show. We've just got to make our own show. We can do this because Rick's a filmmaker. And he said, well, how much money do we have? And I said, well, we don't have any money. Oh, okay. That sounds good. <laughs> so <clears throat> we borrowed this money from this woman, and then we paid her back uh, right after the production was finished. We borrowed $5,000. That's our war chest. Who makes an hour-long documentary for $5,000? And, in fact, what's amazing is, is how cheap we actually make watchers because we're a two-man guerrilla filmmaking crew. And that's what we were forced to learn from the get-go. Rick is used to working very professionally with sometimes, you know, huge, huge crews. I mean, 100, 150 people. That's what he's used to. He's working, used to working in television studios where he's got a set of headphones on and he's directing, you know, six or seven camera guys. You know, okay, camera two on your cue, three, that's what he's used to. So here he is with a Canon 60D camera and we're running around, the two of us. I've got a mic, he's got the camera, let's go. And we've got, we, we interviewed Dr. Lear and some other people who were watchers one. And, you know, we printed like a hundred copies of these things, had no idea what was going to happen. They sold within 24 hours. And we printed, I think, another hundred they sold. Then we printed like 500, and we realized we, we, we hooked into something. We, we're on to something. And so we printed 1,000, and then we started doing labels, and we started doing watchers too. Almost immediately um, after that, we realized that this was no, no one was covering the type of stuff we were covering from our particular worldview, and we went with it. And we've had nothing but success since, and we've, we've actually completed 10 of these. They're on Vimeo, folks, so if, if you just go to my channel, l.a. L.A. Marzulli on Vimeo, you can rent them. So you don't even have to buy them. You can just rent them. And uh, our Vimeo sales are going through the roof because, you know, more people would just rather watch it on Vimeo. And you can save some of the stuff. is like as cheap, I think, as $5 a, a, a show. Uh, Watchers 10 is up there, but, you know, you're going to pay you're going to pay a little bit more for that because it's a brand new film. But I think eight of the shows, eight out of the 10 are up. We've only got to do nine and we're done. So um, all 10 will be up soon and then we're going to have a some kind of a bonus feature on Vimeo. So if you want to watch all 10, you know, we'll, we'll, the heavily discounted type of thing. So that'll be an incentive for people to watch all 10. So that's how it started. You're, you're bringing the facts that are unadulterated, as you said, unscripted. And these are in your face, believe it or not, facts, which yeah. is, you know, basically what I do. That's what I, the code I live by is if you want to know what's going on, I'm going to tell you. Now, Watchers 10. What was the, the point you wanted to make with this one? Well, Watchers 10, the actual title is called Watchers 10 DNA. And what people need to understand is uh, that it's not conclusive, but it's pointing to the veracity of a hypothesis, which has stated uh, that about 3,500 years ago, according to the biblical prophetic narrative, uh, there was a diaspora in the Middle East, specifically in the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, the promised land, as it were. And as Joshua and Caleb and the armies of, of Is the Israelites pressed into this area, they were given this bizarre mandate from the God of the Old Testament. In fact, this is what Richard Dawkins used to portray the God of the Old Testament as this maniacal, capricious, um, homicidal God. And I get it. And if you don't understand what's going on there, that's exactly what it sounds like. Because the mandate is wipe everybody out there, men, women, children, kill all the animals, burn everything. I mean, that's what the mandate is. And there's no way around that. I mean, that's genocide, okay, from our point of view. Unless, drum roll please, unless something is going on there which is not supposed to be. If there's genetic mixing of seed, um, that's not supposed to be happening. And that's what's at stake. And that's, of course, ties into my work for the last 25, 30 years. The Nephilim, the late Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, who was my mentor, 
That book changed my life, The Omega Conspiracy. And I've written books on the Nephilim and the Nephilim Trilogy and um, you know, Days of Chaos certainly talks about it. And the new book, Nephilim Hybrids, that goes along, sort of the companion book with Watchers 10, discusses it also. These are hybrid entities. They're not human. Uh, they're in a fixed mental state. They may actually have supernatural powers. Now, I, I say all these things, and I'm, I realize I'm speculating on, on, in, in some areas. Um, but there's something going on here with these guys. One of the attributes was giantism. Not all of the so-called Nephilim tribes were giants. And the further we go down the rabbit hole with this, we get more and more information. For instance, my work in the Americas, which is uh, uh, basically vetting the oral tradition of a Native American people, who said that there were a race of giant, red-haired, cannibalistic, six-fingers, entities roaming the area before they were here. Now, this is where it gets weird. It gets into the whole Nagpur deal and, you know, Native American. This is why the Kennewick man is such a big controversy. And some people are saying, no, this is, this is, this is, this happened before, um, Native Americans got here. And we maintain that these entities live side by side, Native Americans. There are oral traditions talk about it. In fact, in my new book, Nephilim Hybrids, and I, look, I, I, it sounds like I'm giving a plug here. All I'm doing is referring to basically eight months' worth of work. And if you're interested, you can get that, and there's the information. Well, you, can all all you, want. you can plug all you yeah. want, Alan. <laughs> well, I mean, all we're going to do is scratch the surface here. But I sat down with a Paiute elder, who, and, and she told me the story that red-haired, six-fingered, giant, cannibalistic tribe were there, and the Paiutes wiped them out in the Lovelock Cave they, because they were stealing their children and eating people. I mean, I might make this up. That's what she told me. And that goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years pre-Columbian before the first white men come here. So this is, this is really telling stuff. And those giants, according to the Paiutes, were well over seven, eight feet tall. The one I found out on Catalina, or I should say the two I found out on Catalina, were just under nine feet. And we had that, we had the picture, and this is all in the book and stuff, and it's all in Watchers 10 too, but we're there out in Catalina Island. I'm there in Catalina Island in the archives uh, with John Borgina, the former curator of the Catalina Island Museum. Catalina Island is about 26 miles uh, west, due west of Los Angeles. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, uh, idyllic place, great just to hang out. It's also a tourist trap. But I was there to look at the museum because in 1919 and 1921, Ralph Glidden was out on the island conducting primitive archaeological tour uh, digs there. Primitive archaeological digs out on the island. And he was employed by the High Museum. The High Museum was, was hiring Glidden to do these digs. The High Museum was later gobbled up by the Smithsonian Institute. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm out there because I, I had heard rumor that a cache of records had been found that were the Glidden's lost records. They had been gone for like decades, literally decades. So I fired off an email to the, um, to the director and he, he promptly refused me. And I, I kept at it and kept at it. And finally I offered to pay. A uh, $1,000 um, contribution to the new museum, which, by the way, I was more than happy to do. I mean, great. You know, if, if a, a $1,000 contribution will open the door and allow me to look at the archives, you know, we're both helping each other out. I'm helping you build your museum. You're helping with my research. So he, they gladly took the money, and I was more than happy to write the check. And so I go out there, and um, I'm sitting in the archives, and I got to tell you, within an hour, I'm finding anomalous photographs that should not be there. I'll stress that again. Should not be there. Elongated skulls, skeletons with six fingers, skeletons in situ, which means they've been unearthed exactly the way they were put in to that grave. It's not a disarticulated bone pile. And I took this one picture showing Ralph Gooden standing, leaning on a shovel in a recently excavated tomb. And in front of him is a very large skeleton. I shipped that picture off to three or four different people. Um, three of them completed the task. The fourth guy stated that, in his opinion, there was no photoshopping or tankering with that photograph. And it was me taking a photograph of the other photo, which was from 1919. All that's in the book, I'm a Trail of a Nephilim, Volume 2. I also appeared on the Histories Channel in Search of a Lost Giants discussing this on that show in the season finale in 2015. So we looked at the picture. The three experts digitized it. And they all came up with a figure of about eight foot nine inches, right under nine feet. And we rounded it down 
to eight and a half feet. Well, guess what? That's not supposed to be there. It's not supposed to be there. And so what that does do is it does um, vet. It, it, ends, it lends credence to the Native American oral tradition that these giant uh, cannibalistic entities were running all over the earth when they got here. Well, what's interesting is we also found elongated skulls in those pictures. They shouldn't be there. These are not Native American skulls. They're not. They, they, they look more like the skulls we see in Peru, which is, which is part of our research, ongoing research. All this is in Watchers 10, including the DNA evidence, which is what I started off with. All that to say this, that when they came in, Joshua and Caleb came into the Promised Land, the land of Canaan, 3,500 years ago. The Nephilim were there. They fled. They left the area. Some went northward into Europe, crossed over into the, into the New World, came down and settled, believe it or not, in the Ohio Valley. These were the giants. Others didn't look, weren't, let's say, giants, but they had elongated skulls, like we see in Peru. So we're starting to get a handle on some of this stuff. There's a mixture. In other words, we don't know exactly what's going on. But whatever went on is, has been obfuscated from the people. The information is absolutely controlled. And we show this uh, in Watchers 10. That picture that I discovered in the Catalina Island Museum archives, which was tucked away in a manila folder, wrapped in plastic, tucked in a manila folder, placed in a museum box, locked and put into a vault, never to see the light of day. I discovered that. That picture went viral when I was on the History Channels in Search of the Lost Giants, and also the book On the Trail of Nephilim, Volume 2. What's interesting is, when we went back to the museum, and this is all in the film, Watchers 10, back to the museum, we walk in to what was a reduced exhibit of the Ralph Glidden uh, exhibit in the museum. It was a reduced size, okay? Basically one room. And there's the picture that I discovered, but it's not five by seven. It's like 18 by 18 inches by, you know, 24 inches or whatever. It's blown up, plastered on the wall. And guess what they did? They cropped the giant they, out, they cut it out yeah. of the picture. It's completely out of the picture. It's been deliberately obfuscated, deliberately redacted, deliberately redacted. And when I asked the, the, the curator who's in charge now, why'd you guys do it? Well, we didn't want to offend any Native Americans. And I looked around and I said, <laughs> every single picture in this part of the museum shows Glidden with Native American remains all around him. The picture that you redacted may, in fact, be the only picture which had nothing to do with Native Americans, but in fact l lends credence to their oral tradition of red-haired, six-fingered, cannibalistic giants that roam the Americas. That has to insinuate that, of course, there is a power at B, probably government, that doesn't want the public to know about all this stuff. The research I've done on Nephilim, the, the giants, is that the Smithsonian had a lot of these bones, 20-foot tall skeletons, and, and they're all gone now. Um, you know what? Steve Quayle has talked about the 20-footers, and he puts them a lot higher than I do. And Steve, Steve's been on the trail a long time. Um, and you know what? I, I'm, a, I'm a little bit more conservative. Because when you say 20 feet, that's just mind-boggling. That's just mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just give you an example. There's a picture I use. This guy came up at a conference I was at at Dallas. And he was a seven-foot former basketball player. Just said, I'm six feet tall. I'm a quarter inch under six feet, okay? So I'm six feet tall. This guy is only one foot bigger than I am. He's seven feet tall. Exactly seven feet. Guys, there's a picture. And I look like a shrimp next to this guy. I look like a shrimp. This guy, when you go up, just you just go, he's only a foot taller for crying out loud, but he goes out. He's up and out. I mean, I look like, you know, a shrimp next to this guy. He was absolutely huge and he was only seven feet. So can you imagine, can you imagine a nine footer or like we talk about in Watchers 10? The Kandahar giant found in, in the wilds of Afghanistan, right. which we believe was shot by our military, which the shooter who was there, this ties in with Steve Quayle's work too. You know, bully for Steve. He's the guy who broke the story years ago. Uh, and he was on Coast to Coast breaking it and, and also in his book when the pilot who flew this thing out contacted him. 
and went off the record, just like our shooter and our third witness that we had came in off the record because they can't come on the record. They can't show their face, can't tell you their names. But I know these guys. I mean, I spent quality time with both of these guys, and I can vouch for their for their character. I have to protect my source. They want anonymity, and I understand why. But, you know, Steen's the guy that broke the story. All we did sort of is write in on his coattails with kind of the rest of the story because the shooter came to us. We didn't come to him. We didn't sink this guy out. The shooter came to us, and it came through Richard Shaw. He was on Dr. J's radio show. This guy called in, talking about it's an entirely different topic. The show ended. The guy stayed on the phone. They were all chatting. One thing leads to another. This guy goes, yeah, you know, I know about the Giants. I, sh I shot the one in Afghanistan. And Richard goes, what? He goes, yeah, I was one of the shooters. And he tells the story. Well, look, anybody can say anything. This guy showed me all of his, all of his security clearance cards. Um, you know, all, his passport. I mean, he's the real deal. And when you see him in Watchers 10, uh, every time it gets to the part where the platoon fans out and I'm getting way ahead of myself and his friend, Dan, is impaled by the giant who comes running out of the cave with this spear is probably at least 10 to 12 feet tall and impales Dan and hoists him up into the air. Um, this is gut wrenching, no pun intended. And this is where my where the shooter basically loses it every time in the story, pretty much so, every so, time. Now, this is Afghanistan, and the military troop went to Afghanistan to seek this thing out, right? No. What was happening is this is after the events of 9-11, which is another three-hour conversation, which we won't get into because <laughs> we don't have any time. But I will say this. If you really think the Saudis did it, look at Building 7. <laughs> exactly. All I can tell you. Just look. Just No-brainer. No-brainer. Yeah, no-brainer. So they're there, military's there in the wilds of Afghanistan where the cave complexes are. They're looking for high-value targets. That's what they're there for, high-value targets. So one patrol is dropped by helicopter, 10 to 15 guys, dropped by helicopter, and they start, you know, looking for high-value targets. Well, they missed their first check-in time. They missed their second check-in time. They missed their third check-in time. Okay, something's up. The next morning... Another helicopter is dispatched with another patrol. These guys are on red alert. Did our guys that were here before us, did they get captured? Are they dead? Did they were shot in an ambush? You know, are they still under fire? I mean, what, you know, we had no idea what was going on. So they're dropped off and they just, they start walking, uh, retracing the other patrol steps and they're going down this go trail, pretty steep, very mountainous, rugged area. And at the bottom of the, as they're going down this go trail, the shooter, and we'll refer to him as the shooter, one of the shooters. This guy's in this patrol. And he's looking down, and he sees all these, like, bones at his feet. And, you know, some of them are dry and white. Others got meat on them, you know, and they've been chewed and gnawed. And in the distance, he sees what looks like a piece of our radio gear. And all the guys are, at this point, are on red, red, red alert. I mean, they're like, they're freaking out. You know, something's up. And they know something's up. And this little go trail descends into this, like a, like a, a ledge that's 500 feet above. It's straight down to the valley below, minimum 500 feet. Okay. So it's just, a, it's a precipice, but it's a ledge. It's about 20, 30 feet wide. And these guys start dispersing on this ledge and they look to the left of them and the, above them is the mouth of a cave. And out of this cave comes a nightmare. You can only describe it as that. It's a red-haired being with a large beard, a shield, um, uh, six fingers, six toes, and it's about 12 to 15 feet tall. 12 to 15 feet tall. And this thing roars at them, basically, and they're all stunned. And you and I would be, too. They're just dead in their tracks looking at this thing going like, you know, is this, is, am I in Disneyland? Is this, is, is this Pirates of the Caribbean take two? I mean, where am I? Right. And this guy, Dan, is the first to break out of, of the, the hypnotic sort of trance that everybody's in and who wouldn't be. And he starts firing his weapon at this thing and charging it. This thing moves with such agility and speed that the shooter was blown away at when he's recounting it to me, how fast this thing moved, how agile it was. And that's when he speared this guy, Dan, and held him up. At this point, the other guys break out 
and somebody yells, shoot him in the head, shoot him in the head. And they point their weapons, which are 308s, AK-47s, and 50 caliber uh, uh, weaponry. And they basically blast this guy's face off, literally, basically blast his face off. And he falls to the ground. Dan is still alive. Uh, they wrap Dan up. And the pipe, the spear is still through him. And they, you know, radio for the med, uh, for the medevac. And before it can get there, Dan succumbs to his injuries. And uh, another chopper is dispatched for this giant. At this point, their their training kicks in, and the adrenaline, you know, stops flowing a little bit. And they, the stench of this thing was overwhelming. It was as powerful as a skunk, but it smelled like rotting corpses. They went back into the cave. There were artifacts there, but they had never seen before. Uh, this guy had a very large shield that looked like it was thousands of years old, maybe. Something that you would use, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago. The spear head was about three feet long and very similar to a spearhead that uh, Bob Shelley, a friend of ours, found in the wilds of Michigan. So here we are in Afghanistan, and we find an artifact that looks very similar to that in the wilds of Michigan, and it's made of bronze. And Native Americans didn't work in bronze. And this is a three-foot spear spearhead. It's a pike. And it looks <clears throat> exactly like the guy saw it in Afghanistan. So, you know, once again, it hells back to the legends of the giants. You know, people look at this, well, that's, you know, that's a stretch. And there's no, you know, that's just corroborating evidence. And you can't, okay, fine, I get that. But you know what? Everything keeps pointing back to the veracity of our hypotheses that these giants roamed the earth then, and they may be doing so in modernity. So this thing was was netted up, and the one chopper picked it up, flew it out. The other guys piled into the second chopper. When they landed back at the base, they were debriefed. They wrote their reports. They were told to write their reports again, leaving out any mention of the giant. And that was it. The third witness that we had was deployed to the Kandahar province in 2005. So it's three years after the fact. And when he got there, all he heard were rumors about the Kandahar giant, which was shot. And he had never heard the shooter's story. We didn't tell him that. Never heard the shooter's story. And what he told me on the record was, yeah, we had heard that it was shot at the mouth of a cave and that one of our guys were killed. It was there. People knew about it. We weren't supposed to talk about the story. So not only do we have a shooter, but three years later, another guy was deployed to the same area. Rumors are still circulating about the giant of Kandahar, which all this corroborates back to Steve Quayle's story, and which, which he broke years before, because we broke the story this year. Quayle broke it eight years ago. And, and Steve was saying that, you know, the pilot flew this thing out. So there you go. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible when you think about it. In Watchers 10, you're doing an interview with a Native American elder who talks about them as being star people. Giants, that, where the heck do these giants come from? Six fingers and toes, two rows of teeth. When they talk about them being star people, uh, what kind of indications do you get about the truth of something coming from like an E.T. scenario? Well, and, and here's the deal. We need to define some terms because a lot of people will just immediately go to the ET scenario. And we need to define what an extraterrestrial is. An extraterrestrial is any entity that does not originate from this planet. That's what an extraterrestrial is. So, okay, let's use that term. I believe that the sky people, the people that come from the sky, which Native Americans talk about, okay, those are extraterrestrials. But there's one slight difference where I differ with those guys on ancient aliens. Instead of being extraterrestrial, they, they, can, they can add another dynamic to them. They can be interdimensional as well as extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. And thus, if they're interdimensional, they may have the capability to manipulate time, space, and matter and energy in ways that we can't, which is what we actually see in the biblical prophetic narrative. We see these, these entities... And the Bible calls them angel, but angel is, is angelos, which just means messenger. That's all it states. Uh, there's another grouping which is called the Watchers. Uh, it's a grouping of of these of these entities. Okay, they're called Watchers. So that's that's a double play on words, and that's what we use. That's one of the reasons why we call the series Watchers. We're watching 
but the Watcher Angels were the ones that, that screwed around thousands of years ago, That which in the days of Jared, they landed on Mount Hermon. The Genesis 6 passage tells us they took wives, they just, from whoever they wanted to, they went into them in the biblical sense, they had sex with them, and the progeny of this unholy union becomes the Nephilim. And then we read the Nephilim are on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God, which are the angelic host of heaven, uh, went into the daughters of men and had children by them. What's interesting here is we're not that far off in our paradigms. Um, it's just it's semantics, in my opinion. When people say extraterrestrial, I, I can go right down with them. All I'm doing is adding a slight a slight detour and saying, okay, they're extraterrestrial, but an interdimensional entity doesn't originate from here either. So an interdimensional entity is just as extraterrestrial as someone supposedly coming from the Pleiades or wherever you want to, Zeta Reticuli or wherever you want to call right. it. So the other thing is, is that the quantum physicists now are looking at where we are and they're wondering if we're in some sort of a holographic universe. And if that's the case, then the whole idea of the interdimensional hypotheses begins to even ring more true than what I think it already is. These entities are coming from some other dimension someplace. And look, guys, I have no idea where we are. I really don't. I mean, when I think about this stuff constantly, where are we, you know, um, uh, where are we, where are we going? Where does consciousness seat itself? You know, how do, where do we store memory? How can we bring it up? What is language? How can you hear what I'm saying and understand it? I mean, how does that work? How when I look at something, I can see it and, you know, and it instantly translates to my brain. I mean, you know, how does, how do we get nourishment from food? What really happens when we sleep? And on and on and on it goes. I mean, it's just, I'm just baffled and I marvel at, at life and, and consciousness. I just, I just marvel at it. It's like, oh my gosh, how does all this work? There certainly is a much bigger picture. And with the work I do, I see it on a daily basis about health problems and, and the causes of, especially ones that are unexplainable. Now, you can watch these watchers' videos and tell that everything is hands-on, nothing is CGI, everything is right there in front of your face, documentary style. Let's go forward a little bit, and the skulls, the Nephilim skulls, the elongated skulls, you actually pulled teeth out of these things, you ground down the skulls and made a powder, and you actually did DNA testing on these things. Well, let me clarify some things. First of all, when we call them Nephilim skulls, that's a hypothesis. That's right, we right. We think they're Nephilim skulls. We can't really call them that yet because we don't. We haven't done a full genome workup. Um, if we do that and we see major anomalies in the genome, which are not human, then okay, uh, something's going on here. And at that point, I would say that this is pointing to the veracity of our hypotheses. I mean, that's the whole point of what we're doing. We took hair samples that the late senior Juan Navarro allowed us to take out of Peru legally from his museum. And not a lot of hair. I mean, just, you know, like uh, maybe 100 strands from one, 50 strands from another, that type of thing. And this hair had no scalp in it, and it basically fallen from the skull. And these skulls are in, in display cases with the hair, and that's how we ab were able to get it. And we, we did this, uh, this, the sampling. on. Th we sent it off to three different DNA labs. Two of the DNA labs uh, would would not come on the record at all, including the report, uh, which I've got, which no letterhead, not signed by anybody. That's how, you know, sub rosa they are. Mm. That's just how they had do business. They don't want to be associated with my research. And I understand that. However, they're nice enough to do the DNA testing. The third lab, which was up in Canada, and that was Renee and Stephen Frappietro, husband and wife <laughs> team, in Thunder Bay, yeah. yeah, in Thunder Bay, they came on the record, and that's filmed in Watchers 10, and uh, it's just a riveting article or a riveting interview. Uh, some of that is also in the book, all Nephilim hybrids, but the actual DNA report that Stephen Frappietro wrote is in the book verbatim. So here's the deal. We're saying that based on our um, hypotheses that these – these skulls, that which are greatly elongated, would be more than likely show a European slash Middle Eastern origin. They're coming from the Middle East. There's a diaspora in, in the land of Canaan 3,500 years ago. That's what we're expecting to see. We're expecting to see DNA evidence that points to that. 
that's that would mean that our hypothesis is at least worthy of note. Let's go on to the next step. The the fourth item we were able to take was a skull from a place called La Oroja, which is down in Peru. And this man who has the skull now, um, his grandfather brought it out, or his brother, grandfather's brother brought it out, more than likely in the 30s, 40s, maybe the 50s. We don't know. The provenance of this thing is very mysterious. We only know that the grandfather's brother was an engineer and traveled the world, creating dams and all these, you know, very large um, engineering projects. So we sort of, you know, it's conjecture on our part that either was maybe this was presented to him when he was down in Peru because his brother was a medical doctor. He figured his brother would want to see this thing. He put the suitcase and off he went. Mm -hmm. And this guy's had it for, for decades. And when his grandfather passed away in the 90s, he bequeathed the collection to him, which was, as far as we know, what looks like a Native American skull, a human skull, modern-day Homo sapiens sapien, and then this greatly elongated skull. So the story is this. Once again, Richard Shaw is at a UFO convention in Phoenix, and we're showing, I think, Watchers 8 the year before we had won, uh, Watchers 7 with our, our work on, on UFOs, and he's backstage making sure the projector and the film and the DVD is all working, and he's showing the elongated skull, and uh, this guy comes up, never seen this guy before, and he goes, I got one of those. And Rick goes, <laughs> what? And he goes, yeah. And he takes out his iPhone, he goes, flip, 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 here. And Rick just about falls over. He emails me instantly with the picture. I can't even believe it. I talk to this man within 24 hours, and he allows us to come up to Oregon and take DNA samples. So we were able to take, with a Dremel tool, we went into the into that skull, and we were able to take powder, fresh powder from the skull. We also took small fragments of bone. We took a tooth from the mandible. All I can tell you is that the DNA evidence from all of those other areas in that skull were all over the map. And the geneticist Stephen Frappietro comes on the record and says, if I didn't know better, I would tell you that the that the DNA evidence from the, all those samples were, were different, came from different artifacts, came from different skulls. So that being, with that in mind, the the one that we believe is, and this is what's, what Frat Pietro told us too, we went in with a Dremel tool at the base of the skull, and we, we went in about an eighth of an inch and then took compressed air and blew that out. We are in complete lab gowns. What I mean by that, every every inch of skin except for right around our eyes, and we, we I had glasses on, are covered. It's a full body suit, uh, and then another sleeve that goes over the existing sleeve, two pairs of gloves, boots, masks, hairnet. That's how we're doing this. Try so no keep, risk of contamination. Yeah, to try to eliminate contamination as much as possible. This is the real deal. And Frat Pietro said if he were there, he doubts he could do it any better. Okay? So here's a geneticist tipping his hat to us. He told us what to do. He followed his instructions to the letter. So we're going in about an eighth of an inch at the foramen magnum area. And then we take compressed air and we blow the whole thing well, out. What, what is the foramen magnum area? What's foramen that? magnum area is at the base of the skull where the spinal column attaches to the base of the skull. Right, right. Okay. Very dense piece of bone. So we're doing this. And then we go back in with the Dremel tool. And we get a lot of fresh, good powder, fresh material, uncontaminated material. As uncontaminated as you're going to get it. And it falls on the paper, and that paper is immediately wrapped up, put in an envelope. Next day, it was sent up to the lab. Okay, so now we've got the hair samples, which I talked about. I've got the powder. There was only enough powder that the Canadian lab was able to test it. We didn't have enough for the other lab uh, in California. But the California lab tested the hair, and they came up with uh, H2A, H2A1, which is a European haplogroup. The haplogroup comes from the female side of the family, from the mitochondrial DNA. And this is from, again, the, mother, the maternal side of the family, from the mother, and it's Eastern European, European. That's not supposed to be there, guys. It's not. It's not supposed to be there. The powder was was haplogroup T as in Tom, T2 
B, T to B. The entire genetics report is in the back of the book, in the appendix, in Nephilim Hybrids. You can read it for yourself. More testing needs to be done. I get that. But T2B originates in, drumroll please, Syria and Mesopotamia. That's Nephilim Central. That's where everything starts from, right there. That's where it starts from. That's where the outbreak happens in Genesis 6 and also afterwards. That points back, in my opinion, to the veracity of our hypotheses, at least enough to go to the next step and try to do a full genome, and that's what we're doing. To do that, you've got to get permission from the Peruvian government to actually get fresh samples out, and we are in the process of attempting to get that permission. How long does it take to get something out of Peru? We've been on it for three years. Yikes. Red tape everywhere. Yep. And you know something? Nobody's tested these. Nobody. Nobody's gone that nobody's gone that far. So Ellie Marzulli and the Watchers is, is going where no man has gone before. Yeah, you can say and the information you get is just the information you have to accept, right? Well, I mean, look, the, the information that we get is not conclusive. And I I mean I stated that. It, it's it's not conclusive by any means, but it's pointing to the veracity of our hypotheses. And that's what's that's what's so interesting about it. I mean, we're like we're 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 beside ourselves. When we got the information from a La Oroja skull, we were just blown away. T2B, and then the hair comes back, um, you know, H2A, H, H2A. I mean, we're just, we're just like, you got to be kidding me. Um, when we go to Peru, and I know it's going to happen at some point, we will get as many samples as we possibly can. And all this costs money. I mean, that's what people don't get. People go, oh, this information should be free. Okay, so so how do we pay for it then if it's going to be free? And we've got one, you know, several people that have donated um, a nice sizable chunk of cash to allow us to continue with the research. Without that, there's no way. Look, just for me to take the crew down there, and the crew is two archaeologists. Richard Shaw is our, you know, the director of Watchers, and he's going to film everything, has to. And then we have Chase Klotsky, who is our uh, field forensic expert, and Chase... Chase runs the lab while we're down there. Uh, then we've got all the all the material from the Canadian lab, which we have to take out. Probably two suitcases filled with uh, disposable suits, because every time we we test a new um, a new artifact, a new skull, everybody's got to suit up again. You know, you you can't you can't do the DNA testing from one skull and then bring another skull into the room and start drilling into that. Can't do that. You got to blow everything off with air. You got to change your suits outside, bring in new suits, and then bring in the skull. And then you got to take the Dremel and go in, you know, kind of go in with um, a solution and wipe the skull down to try to decontaminate as much as possible. Go in just like we did with the La Jorola skull. Go in about an eighth of an inch, blow that out with the compressed air, then get fresh DNA material, bag that up, and that's what Chase is so good at because she'll be wearing a suit. And she'll be in that enclosure, wherever that thing is, with the guys. Um, and I might be one of those guys taking the sample, holding the skull, making sure that the powder falls and all that. So, I mean, when we go down there, you know, that's – think about it. That's five to six people, airfare, meals, hotel room. I mean, it's like, you know, that's $10,000 without blinking an eye just to get the material. So, Just, so you're so every, everything is is kept credible. Everything is kept uncontaminated, and there's nobody you can point, point a finger and say, "Well, you 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 picked your nose before you did the DNA sample." So how can we know it's? Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to belabor this, but there's there's some guy, you know, God bless him, but he wrote this ridiculous hit piece on us a couple of weeks ago, and I didn't respond, but my partner Richard Shaw did. He basically just said, "You haven't even looked at the film or read the book." You're just you're just talking out the side of your mouth. You have no idea of what was in there. And he calls it, you know, sloppy scholarship, to use his quote. The bottom line was the sloppy scholarship was on this gentleman's particular article. He never saw the film. He had no idea what he was talking about. And, in fact, the book does show the entire uh, report from the Canadian lab, Lakehead University. You can read it for yourself. Anybody can read it. Did we, did we do peer review? No, it's too early for that at this at this point because it's just it's inconclusive. It is, and we know that, and we say that over and over again. However, however, the fact that it's there 
in, in some ways is beginning to rewrite the history of the world that we're told about at the end of the last ice age, you know, whenever that is, and people put different dates on that. The Bering Strait, which is now a, a land, a, a seaway, mm -hmm. was a land bridge. And the people from Asia came over and populated the new world. Well, you know, since, since we've come out with this report, all of a sudden I've been noticing different articles. Oh, well, you know, the Beringian land bridge thing is, uh, not holding water anymore. People are realizing that people came from other, hello, that's exactly what we're saying. <laughs> Thor Heyerdahl already proved it. People, he, he built a boat called Ra, papyrus boat. And he sailed from, I believe, out of a delta in Egypt. And he wound up in Barbados in the New World without a map, without a compass, without anything. And that just shows you what it's what it's like. People are curious. And that's a lot of hypotheses. A lot of the messages that I get when I do my work, and it's a lot of just jump in messages here and there. History is going to change. The real history of, of what has gone on on this planet and all the different numbers of civilizations. Look at Machu Picchu. Look, look at yep. Gobli Tepli. Look, look at everything. We're going to learn exactly what that was all about. And you know what? Somebody lived in this house before we did. That's right. So it's a mystery. Well, humans love mysteries. We always got to figure everything out. So we just are going to learn who was here before this with humanity itself. What are we composed of? I mean, I, I understand that our DNA is 12 different strands of DNA compressed into one. And look, I mean, I agree. There's there's only – when watching in Crick, the, the code discovers of a deoxyribonucleic DNA spiral of life, as I call it, the molecular structure, the incredible complexity to the deoxyribonucleic double helix spiral of life. When, when Crick saw that, Crick was a vex man. And he's looking at this thing going like, you know, this just didn't spring into existence. And when, when Stein, Ben Stein's movie, Expelled, sits down with Richard Dawkins, who was one of the premier evolutionists of the 20th and 21st century, and he says, well, how do you think it came about? All Dawkins can say is that some other culture rose by some sort of Darwinian process to a high rate of civilization, and then seeded us here. That's called panspermia. The problem with that concept is that where did they come from? And see, it goes around and around and around. How did they originate? Because this, this coding is really, really complex. Really, really complex. And no one knows our origins. So if there's a supernatural origin to it, which is where I, of course, that's my paradigm, that's what I believe, then a lot of things begin to make sense if it's supernatural. Because now I've got something that, that can manipulate space, time, matter, and energy in ways that we can't, at least, at least where we are here. And so creation, um, ex nihilo may be possible with some sort of a supreme being type thing. And that's the paradigm which I hold to. Because otherwise, you're up against the the proverbial dog chasing its tail. It's circular reasoning. And, okay, well, where did that race of aliens come from? The, you know, that rose to some sort of a high... You know, where does the first self-replicating molecule come from? And Dawkins, you know, states on the record, and he's very taken aback by the question and very uncomfortable with it. And I understand. Because that's that's what basically hoists his... His, um, his answer on intellectual petard, as it were. And he sits there and he goes, well, no one knows. Okay, we get that. No one knows. I get it. Nobody knows. Here's Richard Dawkins. And he tells you straight up, we don't know where the first self-replicating molecule <laughs> came from. Okay, I get it. Great. So if we don't know, then, you know, why can't we have a supernatural explanation? Why are we so incensed that we can't go there? What's wrong with you people? I mean, how do we know that there's no, there's another dimension or other dimensions outside of that. I mean, we don't know where we are. As I said earlier, consciousness, how does it work? How does language work? How does memory work? Nobody knows any of this stuff. Nobody has a clue. You know, you can dissect the brain till you come, to the cows come home, and no one ever finds the place where consciousness sits. That, that's we because it sits at a level that science does not go. 
And it's, it's people who do my type of work, people who, who do channeling, who bring in bits and pieces of it. Nobody has the real answer to all this. Everybody has little bits and pieces and opinions. And, and that's, that's kind of where it sits right now. I want to talk about the critter. Okay. Now, uh, in Watchers 10, um, th- there is this, it looks like a little, I'm going to say demon with wings that somebody has in, in, a, in, a, in a glass and somebody found this thing and uh, there's no denying that, that this is something organic, okay? So, something that, that at one time was real before it died. Now, uh, what is your take on, uh, the, we're calling it the fairy, right? I'm calling it a fairy? Well, let me, first of all, it was presented to Jaime Masson years ago by a 13-year-old boy on his way from Guadalajara to Mexico City. And he went out in the middle of the night or at nighttime with the family car. You know, their family's in the, in the car, kids in the back seat, and he goes out to relieve himself. And he doesn't finish his business. He looks down to the left or to the right or whatever, and he sees this thing that was already dead lying on the road. So he picks it up, and they bring it to Jaime. And that's where we come in. Jaime had this thing. Uh, we, we flew down to interview Jaime Masson and uh, for a Watcher 7 for our UFO film. And, and Jaime, you know, we get there and it's like, uh, we're getting ready to interview Jaime. Richard's met him once. I've never met him. I've talked to him on the phone, but I've never met the guy. We're in an undescript four-story building in Mexico City. Uh, we're down in the waiting room. Jaime appears on the second floor balcony. Come on up, guys. Marsh- Marzuli, Shaw. So we go bounding up the spiral staircase to Jaime's office. He takes us into his office, explaining the whole way. He's recording a show for this week. He's got to go. He'll come back in about an hour. Meantime, make yourself home. And, oh, look at this. And he reaches up behind him into a cabinet and takes down this jar and sets it on his desk and, and walks out of the room. <laughs> you know, I'll be back in an hour. And Richard and I are going, you have got to be kidding me. And there, in this glass jar, suspended in what we now know as formaldehyde, is this creature. Jaime calls it the creature. Richard calls it the fairy. I call it the winged nightmare. So we all have different names for this thing, <laughs> you know? Creature, fairy, winged nightmare. I call how, it. How, how big is this thing? About nine inches. Okay. It's about nine inches. It's got wings. It's got teeth like a lion. It's got a stinger like a scorpion. It's very, very unnerving, very, very strange. And we don't know what we're looking at. And we wait for Jaime. Jaime comes back down. We get in a conversation with him about it. Jaime will not let us use the film. Uh, we, we, we talked to Ricardo Rengel about it. He's a PhD who's done some of the testing on it. Uh, that day we, we were there, Providence. They take the thing out of the jar. They get an x-ray. We get, we look at the x-rays. It's the first time anybody's x-rayed this thing. And there are these hot spots in the radiograph, which are which are spherical. They're all the same size, and they're asymmetrically placed throughout the creature. And when I see this, I go, well, maybe that's a hoax. Maybe that's how they're putting this thing together. Somebody suggests, because it's Jaime Masson, and they're all into UFOs and implants and everything else, that maybe these are implants. Well, we don't know what we're looking at. So three years go by, and Rick calls Jaime and says, Jaime, can we use the piece? And Jaime says, sure. So... And Jaime also let me use the picture for uh, the cover of the book, Nephilim Hybrids. And by the way, it has gone viral. It's, mm-hmm. it's close to 600,000 views now. And it just constantly going through the roof, which is great. And um, people need to see this stuff. So I said, Jaime, can I see the x-rays? So Jaime sends me up the x-rays. And we make a, um, an appointment with a veterinarian, local veterinarian, to look at the x-rays. And at this point, guys, I'm leaning towards hoax. And Richard, Richard's not sure. We don't know what we're looking at. You know, it's like, if it's too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true, right? So we just resolve ourselves that we're just going to present it and we're not going to say what it is, if it's real, if it's not real. If it's a hoax, then we're going to say it's a hoax. If it's real, then that's what we're going to say. So, you know, we don't know. And... um so I have the x-rays. I make the appointment with the vet. And uh, we're, this is like midweek. So we're supposed to see the vet on Saturday. And we are up against the wall with, with our deadline for Watchers 10 getting it out. And this is our last shoot. No more shoots after Saturday. Rick's going to hole up in the edit suite. He's got to get this film out. We've got a deadline. Got a major prophecy conference I'm going at. 
we've got to get this thing done so much. We just can't be waiting around and doing another shoot. At the last minute, the veterinarian calls us and tells us he has to cancel on Saturday. So I'm bummed. Richard's bummed. He's editing. So Monday morning comes, <clears throat> excuse me, I email the vet, and I go, hey, can I come down with the x-rays today? He apologizes for not being able to make it on Saturday. He informs me, yes, you can come on down. So I went on down with the x-rays, waiting there in a little waiting room. They usher me into this small cubicle examination room, and in comes the good doctor. And I told him, I said, look, thanks for taking your time. I want to show you some x-rays. This will be something that you've probably never seen before. <clears throat> and um, just don't be alarmed. And I gave him the backstory where where this thing was found and how we got the x-rays and, and everything else. And I say, first of all, do the x-rays look real? There's there's like the x-rays are here I have. There's like four different, there's two different shots of the thing. And, and we did it in like a sepia and then sort of a black and white, like mm -hmm. a normal radiograph. And he looks at the thing and goes, these are real x-rays. I go, okay, that's good. We, we knew that. But is it, my first question to him, is this creature a composite? Or what you, is what you're looking at in the x-rays, Does is it the x-rays showing that this thing is made up of three or four different creatures? And he's looking at this thing and he goes, L.A., I got to tell you, if this is if this is a hoax, if this is, you know, someone put this thing together, it's a masterful job. <clears throat> masterful job. I can see the space where the, the femur attaches itself to the pelvic girdle and there's an equal space around that. The legs are hollow, just like you would expect from something that flies. It's like chicken bones. The leg bones are hollow. The arm bones are hollow, just like you would expect from something that flies. There's a very hot spot. Anything that, that's any, any um, bone marrow or muscle that's really dense, it'll show up hotter. Like like a like white bright bright white, so the, so the more dense an object is, the hotter it gets in the radiograph. The whiter it gets, the brighter it gets. And the area, of course, the skull is very white. The area where the wings attach themselves to the back were also very lit up, very white. <clears throat> and I said, well, I mean, this thing's got wings, so I mean, it's got to have some muscle and bone there because this thing's got to attach. It's flying around. And that's a lot of stress on the, you know, so something's got to be happening. And he agreed. And then I just went, well, you know, once again, he went back to the idea that it's not a hoax in his opinion because of the fact that the skeletal system, and he goes, I can see the sternum. I can see, he could see how all the parts were there and it fit anatomically perfectly, which is why he kept defaulting to if it's a fake or a hoax, masterfully done. Well, if it's a hoax, well, where's the hoaxer? Why didn't he, you know, give it to, um, you know, the son or something, and it's all over the paper, and he's making, you know, $100,000. Right. The kid's on the side of the road, and Jaime sat on this thing, and now we're trying to vet it one way or the other. We've got no dog in the hunt here. We're just trying to vet the thing. That's all we're doing. We're doing due diligence, which is why it's down at the veterinarian, which is why we've got the freaking x-rays for crying out loud. <laughs> That's what we're doing. You know, we're not going out with this thing. Up until this point, I'm going, maybe it's a hoax. It's got to be a hoax. It can't be real. Maybe these white dots or what the thing, you know, they're hot glue and it puts the thing together. I don't know, which is why we're at a veterinarian's looking at the thing. The veterinarian goes, I've seen those before. I go, seen what before? He goes, those white dots. I go, what do you mean you've seen those before? He goes, those are BBs. I go, BBs? <clears throat> what do you mean BBs? And he goes, like buckshot. Like bird shot. And I go, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Somebody shot this thing out of the sky. And what blew us away, guys, completely blew us away is when we were in, when I was at the Prophecy Watchers Conference. Okay. And that the Prophecy Watchers Conference in, in Colorado Springs. And I had two hunters who didn't know each other come up to me and tell me. And they looked at the x-rays because I had the x-rays there. And they said, L.A., that's number seven bird shot. That's number seven bird shot. Really? And, and the creature was shot between 50 and 75 feet away. Holy mackerel. Now, now, if that isn't convincing, somebody recognizing the pattern, recognizing all that stuff. There it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I've seen these pictures. And, and, you know, it's even got a broken leg. 
And that's from the bird shot. The bird yeah. shot snapped its leg. Now, right now, the x-rays are at a forensic pathologist, and we're waiting to hear back from him. So we're on a trail. As I speak, we're attempting to get the creature, the fairy, the winged nightmare, out of Mexico, back to Los Angeles, where we can do more extensive testing on it. It's not over, guys. That's what being on the trail is. It's all about. You know, yeah, we're, no. we're constantly researching. I take my pendulum. I ask some questions. And what I was told is that it is a demon of Satan. Well, here's the deal. I had somebody who um, was actually an ex-Illuminati who was a, he was a warlock before he became a Christian. This guy was deep and, and had all sorts of demonic activity. He took one look at it and just told me it was an imp. Um, imp. That's what it was, an imp, I-M-P. But different people have called it different things. So, um, you know what, guys? It's uh, We think it's real. That's what I've been telling people. Um, again, the vet looked. I had a I had a radiologist, one of the foremost radiologists in the United States. Look at the look at the radiograph. Look at the X-ray. And this is what he wrote to me. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. He basically stated this: My gut tells me it has to be a fake. Has to be a fake. But I'm looking at it, and I don't know what it is. It looks real. So his gut's going. It can't. Yeah, because his gut's going. I, I know what I'm looking at. This is a wing nightmare. This can't be here. It's not happening. There is no supernatural. My paradigm is being bent. I have cognitive dissonance. Please go away. You know, I'm laughing because I don't know what else to do. I'm laughing nervously. My gut tells me it's got to be fake, but uh, the x-rays are real. So, you know, we're, that's why we're on the trail, guys. That's why we're on the trail. D draw your own opinions. Look at it. And, you know, uh, the... the we, we've just posted the, the x-ray in the chat so people can look at it. It is on the internet. You can see it. We've got a question for you. What institutions have been hindering your work and research? Who has been the most helpful with your research? Well, this is from no, Germany. Yeah, there's no institutions. There's just there's people that that um, will not come on the record and, and state, let's say, one of two of the DNA labs will not allow us to use their names. They will not allow us to use their names. The other lab in Canada will. So uh, Catalina um, allowed me to come in, but now they've redacted the photograph. So why would they do that? That's what we call damage control. So um, there's no institutions, per se, that are, that are against us. I'm, look, we're, Richard Shaw and I are small potatoes. I mean, you know, if we had, like, millions and millions and millions of hits on YouTube, then we'd be, we'd be considered a threat. But people, you know, the, the powers that be look at us and, and they go, no one's listening to Marzulli mm -hmm. and Shaw. And they're right. Nobody is. You know, oh, big deal. We get like 600,000 hits on YouTube. Oh, well, you know, there's six, there's what, six, seven billion people on the planet. I mean, look, uh, what, what's his face? Um, pie, right? Uh, right, right. gangman style, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it? Two billion hits on YouTube? Now that's, that's something. That just tells you the mentality of people. You know, two billion hits on, on Gangman Style. Thank you. And we have <laughs> a half, you know, half a million hits. Only a half a million. I mean, do the math, right? There's a huge disparity between those numbers. You, you've got actual proof of alien life, and this guy's dancing stupid, and he's getting a thousand gazillion hits. There you go. Go figure, guys. For those of you who want to check the stuff out, you can go to our Vimeo channel. You can rent Watchers 10. L.A. Marzulli is what you type in. Or you can go to the website, lamarzulli.net, lamarzulli.net, and uh, you can, you know, purchase hard copy or, or the book or whatever and, uh, and go from there. But it's, it's, we feel it's cutting-edge information. Times are changing. Information is coming forward. Whistleblowers are, are a dime a dozen yeah. now. People yeah. are coming forward who have actually been there, done that, and, and want to talk about it. This type of information is what's needed to awaken people that, hey, you know what? Something is going on in this planet with humanity, and there are certain institutions that don't want us to know it. Look at the Smithsonian being hidden from humanity 
but it's starting to come out now. And and what it needs is legs. What it needs is credibility. And what you're doing with your research is giving it that credibility. You know what? If you haven't seen the Watchers videos yet, go on Vimeo, rent all 10 of them. They are, number one, they're entertaining. They're fun to watch. They're easy to watch. And they're interesting. They keep you on the edge of your seat. I'm serious. These videos, when I watch them, I always go, oh, you're watching that new one? Let me watch it with you. We sit and watch it, and it's like, wow, it really gives you something to think about. I know you got to go, but uh, we can't I'll wait for, for you guys. <laughs> uh, we're going to have you back on as soon as the time is right. Everybody, thank you so much, Ali Marzuli, for being on again. This is Chris Kaler. We are out of here. <laughs>